Lord John and he is a native uh, Virginia. He grew up in Portland, Annandale. <coughs> he actually went to the same college as I did um, in the Commonwealth University in Richmond. Woo! Yeah. Big, big uh, yeah. <laughs> With a bachelor's in fine arts uh, since 1980 when he graduated. Afterwards, he worked for the Miller and Road Interior Design Studio in Richmond, which is a pretty prestigious um, uh, studio back then. Then he worked for the Rutkey Associates in Falls Church. Um, right down the road, they're, they're gone, but they're right on the street. In the past, he used to uh, flip burgers for a Roy Rogers restaurant in Maryfield. A lot of burgers. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of chicken. And um, after college, uh, John um, worked for the administrative office of the United States Sports Club, my time as a state programmer, before going full time. And uh, since then, he's worked, he's currently a facilities um, program manager where he uh, worked on courthouse renovation, helped manage over 24 different uh, courthouses, uh, built new chambers, courtrooms, expanding uh, probation and clerk's office. Um, he's working at uh, well, um, over 32 years now. Uh, I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John's hobbies include painting, drawing, hiking. Um, personal goal is to eat every single day at a new Asian restaurant. My <laughs> 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 um, favorite thing to do is to drive with the windows down. Um, uh, diamond pathway over Moon River to Cutaway Island in Georgia. Parents live. Uh, personal model and uh, live your own life. Of your life. I like what you said about the spiritual, the physical, it all combines. It really is everything. One, but my dad is a prince. He's just my role model. Pick, pick somebody. He just kind of made it. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Bob. Uh, one last. Uh, you want to tell everyone a little bit about yourself? So, I'm Amy Woods. I'm currently the musical scholarship coordinator at ASS. I'm also a senior at McLean High School, and next year we're going to be going to James Madison. James, you're going to be senior. I think what I really want to learn today is learning or realizing what I really want to do. Because in college, I think that's really important. And when you're going to college, you think, I've got it all figured out, and this is what I want to do. You know what, when I was at BCU, I found out there were some things that didn't. And sometimes it's when you're actually in school. 
and a professor told me uh, her name was Horn Schroeder. She was German. She was incredible. And she lived in a house designed by Derek Rettfeld, who was a Bauhaus architect. And she said to me, and uh, I didn't ask her, and it was, you have to find out what it is in your career that you really are passionate about. And that's why I came up with the problem. Is I remember that statement she made to me what you're passionate about. And you'll get there. We all know Oprah Winfrey, we all know her story. That's what she said. You know, I was passionate about getting my own network and it happened. But she started with small roles. And she started as a weather person in Texas. And she has an So you start out with the small roles. You find somebody who will emulate. Many people emulate them, but they're not open. So that's what you have to do is find what you personally are passionate about. Mm -hmm. And it'll, it'll generally happen. There's a topic called chasing the pins. Can you tell me and give the one way success on the spot? Leading off on that, I really went, I wanted to go to Virginia Tech because I wanted to be an architect. And I'll get into a little bit of story about that with the slides, but I was a very poor man. I, I love TurboTax because it's smarter than me. And it calculates things, and the bank calculates things. I just didn't have the grades on my SAT score to do the math, so I was waiting to get my letter from Virginia Tech. I got the letter that said, sorry. And I remember sitting there, and my mother, my mother, she said, look, John, she said, you've got to choose somewhere. You've got to choose some place of the way path. And I said, well, I like design. I like buildings. And I like interiors. So I applied uh, after Virginia Tech. It was sort of a very quick process, because now you have to do it, I think, in your sophomore, sort of in your sophomore year, actually, junior year. So I had to kind of fast track it, but I did a portfolio of my work, and I had to interview with the dean of the art school. I mean, you're 17, you know, you're 18, you know, you think, if I don't get this, I'm going to flip burgers for the rest of the day. <laughs> and that's what I was thinking. You know, it's going to be on Rogers forever. <laughs> Which isn't bad. Okay. <laughs> um, so I really was learning at a very young age what I was going to do, even though I didn't have a little thing. And uh, sometimes that's what happened. And I blossomed. I got to VCU, and there were people just like me who I never met in high school that didn't have the same passions about design and about buildings, because they were about math, science, and, and, and reading and, and literature. Um, that's most of my friends were doing. So it became a process where I grew to Personally, when I went to BC. And then the first couple of jobs that I had, which at the time I thought, why am I here? I'm sitting here doing these weird stair details for this architect, which was so boring. This was rut camp so kids. And during college, I was working as a, a studio assistant to some three very old women who didn't really understand what interior design was going to be. You know, they didn't know about offices, they didn't know about workstations, they were still doing dining. You know, the draperies and chandeliers, which I have many stories about that. But it, it really was a growing education because at a very young age, you really don't know yet what you really want to do. It's a springboard. What you start in college is really what you sort of learn what you want to become. Um, one of the questions was, of course, about setting your goals about small goals. And where you are is the Department of State. Yes. Okay. Um, how many years people remember 25 years ago what IT really was? I mean, some of you, of course, weren't even around, but IT for, for me was a seven button intercom phone, a typewriter that had carbons and paint. Anybody even seen one of those? Like a carbon thing? <laughs> 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 the government lost paper. You know, we've become paperless, but it took a culture, it took a whole generation, me, to cycle through the government to now come to where it's paperless and it's all electronic. So 25 years ago, no one knew what's happening 
So you're in a field, and in the next 25 years, who knows what is it going to be implanted into my cortex? <laughs> Do my body's just going to ring and I'm going to answer the phone? I mean, it, it sometimes it's coming. So we don't even know. We can't even look to the future for that, but we can plan and accept change. And part of your passion is accepting change as it comes and not resisting change. We've had a lot of change in our lives. We've had it almost daily. You know, we're told, you did this, now you're doing that. And it's like nature. And we have to change the way we do this. So when you're in college, when you prepare to go to college, you think this is the way it's going to be, you will evolve. And you just have to accept that as you go. It's scary. It was for me. Because I just wanted a job that made a lot of money and had a fast car and a girl. That, that was my goal. That was, that was what I was passionate about. <laughs> so, well, those slides are coming. Uh, you know, but I don't know if you've had some questions too that we really talked about that we went over. Those would be good to sort of jog my memory. Um, I think I'd like to ask you did you mention that you um, have a Bachelor of Fine Arts? And um, I was just wondering, because you know, nowadays our, our younger generation is told that getting a master's degree would get you a better job. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, you think of being an artist, you're going to starve, you know, and you're not going to make any money. Uh, everybody remember the guy named Andy Warhol? Okay. Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol started from doing illustrations for a shoe company. He was doing advertising art. And even some of his early sketches were worth several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's incredible, you know, what even he thought and people thought of him was, was minimized. But great art I found come out of Historically, they're, they're peasants. The great artists, and I'll talk about one that is one of my artists. They don't start out rich and wealthy. They don't start out from really good families. They were given a talent, and they used it. And many of them didn't go to school. Picasso, he, you know, he wasn't in school. Um, I don't think Andy, I think Andy Warhol did go, but he dropped out. But even if you go to art school and you get a master's in fine arts and painting, if you follow that, and if you really do, and I know this sounds cliche, believe in yourself, if you're good, people are going to go after what's good. That's what I think. If you're really a good artist and you're consistent, and you may go years without getting any recognition, but generally what happens is somebody goes, that person is good. That person is worth the best quality. The, the auctions this year at Bottoms and Christie's were off the chart. Uh, the art was selling for amazing prices. I was reading the New York Times was simply sold for nothing. That ten years ago sold for nothing, and now it's worth a lot of money. But it's an intrinsic value that we put on things. It's not what it's really valued, you know, in terms of great art. Uh, George Surratt, do you remember the painting? It's in the Chicago Institute. It's huge. It's pointillism. And before we had great art, we had these. We just had screens. And it's called An Evening on the Grand Jot. And it's from France. And he had an assistant that he named Dot. He renamed her. Woman. Renaming somebody because you paint in dots. Mm -hmm. But he said, All we leave is great art and children. All we leave is great art and children. So it's what we leave that. After 1880 and 1890, and, and now that still exists. People still go to the Chicago Art Institute and stand and look at this huge canvas of that painting and are inspired by it. So he didn't go to school. He didn't have a master's, of but people still respect him and his art if it would say it would be worth. Yeah, my, I have. I've done some art. I haven't done of that, that quality. Um, we've seen it out here. Some of it's cartoons, some of it's watercolor. So we talked a little bit about this this morning. Your avocation, what you do on the side as a hobby, actually should become your vocation. What you really love to do, what you're truly passionate about, 
on a Saturday after hours after work in your bedroom is what you really should be doing. But of course, you got to earn a living. You know, you have to pay the bills, you have to pay the mortgage. That's all fine, but don't forget about your education. You've got to really sort of keep that going. And I'm bad about it. I mean, I do maybe two or three things a year. I need to do more of that. You really guilt and live with that. Um, passion about things and passion about people. Um, I found that people, of course, matter a lot more than people. And I know this culture in which we live in, in northern Virginia and the surrounding area, it's, it's all about consumerism, as we know. And that's good. We all have businesses and we all you know, earn a living. But don't forget to do something for somebody else. Don't forget about something, somebody who's out there who may need something, who need, need some help from you. Right? And if you're with a charity and organization, if you're with Somebody who needs some extra help now and then, just do that. Just find a couple of hours to do something for somebody. Um, you're going to have to jog my memory again because I'm getting old. I remember some things. Sure, absolutely. Tell us about your story. Yes, um, this is my story of Edie. Um, as you can see, this is my sister Susan, who's two years older. And I asked my mother, I said, what was I eating? You know, what did they give me to keep me quiet? She said, I have no idea, John. You just wouldn't, you know, you were just grabbing it. So uh, that's why I like to eat. I started at about a year old. So that's starting out with me. My sister is my best friend. And you're going to be your brother's best friend. He won't like you. <laughs> this is interesting. I didn't pay attention to something. Of course, my passion then was to be a cowboy. Uh, my grandparents bought us these outfits on a trip somewhere and said, Come on, take a picture. Um, who has the holster? Who has the holster? She does. Exactly. Big sisters keep the holster. <laughs> they carry the gun. I didn't notice that because I was supposed to have <laughs> so, by the way, my father made this fence in our house in Portsmouth. He made every one of these pickets, and it was a half-acre site. So this was all half-acre fences. So, there's my dad. That's the last time a young boy tried to look like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that was 1963 or 64. Um, we always say, where's our mother? Where's our mother in these photos? She's holding the camera. You know, she's the person out here holding it, and her shadow is usually across the grass. And that was a beautiful house that we lived in off of Route 17 in Portsmouth. That um, was older and had been renovated badly. But that door comes up in so many photographs. When I see that door, I'm taken back 40 and 50 years when I see you know, that house. Beautiful old house. My sister was always taller. She always standing there with me, grabbing me nuts. Okay, this was Admiral Miller of NAVC, and it was 1975, and I'm doing kind of a star skin hutch there. Um, that was the first time, yeah, I know, you're laughing. Uh, yeah, you like the polyester jacket. First time I actually got an award entering an art show, and I was petrified because I saw these other people who were so much better than me. Because I was in my little bedroom doing this. So I didn't have an exposure. I was in high school, but I had never competed, but I got I don't know what it was, an award for this. I was so, you see, he was trying to talk to me, and I was like, well, <laughs> I don't know what to say. I was so ill at ease. You know, you just, you grow out of that. Next slide. Oh, oh, this is good. This is my brother in law, Michael McGuire. This is a good story. Um, they didn't like each other. They despised each other. Their first date was horrible. My sister said, I hate it. I never want to see them. They're married. <laughs> um, he was a lieutenant in the Navy. He was in the, the academy. He grew two inches in the academy. He wanted to be a Navy flyer. He's 6'9 with a helmet. Whoa. He couldn't 
sit in the house there. Oh, oh my God. Like, he was <laughs> devastated. He said, this is the only reason why I went into the Navy like my father, was to be a Navy pilot. So he thought, i got to complete the academy. i got to get out. He paid his five years as a lieutenant. He was a security officer. But um, I asked him, I said, Michael, did that just destroy you? He says, no. Yeah. He says, it doesn't destroy me. He said, I went on. He says, I would have never met your sister. Because it was his commander on the day of in Charleston, South Carolina, that introduced my sister to me. So because of that connection, they would have never met. Um, it was a beautiful way. Okay. He still beats it with the sword. <laughs> Uh, this is my grandfather, who um, took me on rides with him. When he was the, the uh, local carpenters union representative in Portsmouth, North of Suffolk, and Chesapeake. That's in the Virginia Beach, Chesapeake area, Virginia. He was the, I think, president or vice president of the carpenters union. They had unions for the carpenters. They were trade unions, and he had to pay dues. He had to go to every site and check in to make sure these guys working on the site were union, because that's what they were back then. Now Virginia is a right to work state. You don't have to work. I didn't know all that when I was five and six years old, but he would say, John, go over there and go ask that man, I was five or six, if he's paid his dues. He realized a little boy asking a man to pay his dues, they were likely to get paid in a few hours. So I would make the rounds with him. Another prince of a man. He always did something for other people. During the Depression, he walked eight miles to Jonesboro, Tennessee, and back to the because he didn't have a car, but the job was in Jonesboro. Every day, eight miles. Back. So that's, we have stories. We all have stories. There's my dad, and uh, this is my mother, my beautiful mother. And um, this is how they met story. My father was in the Marine Corps, and he had a Marine Corps buddy who was out on a date and borrowed my father's clothes all the time. Mm -hmm. My father said, I'm sick of this. I want to find out where my clothes are going every night. You know, he's meeting all these women, he's using my clothes. This is ridiculous. So they go to Choose Drive In in Portsmouth. They had drive ins, first fries were 10 cents. You've heard these stories. Mm -hmm. um, so he was in a car, my mother was on a date in another car. Mm -hmm. This is unlike my father. He walked out of the car of his date. He walked over the car of my mother's date and said, Hello, I'm Alan Myers. That's how he met. That's how he met. And um, my mother says, I never saw the clothes. He, he got me clothes. <laughs> this house in Richmond is where I got to live for a year, built in 1911. Again, my passion for buildings and architecture, I was just over the moon to live in this house with Mrs. Walker. She took in boarders. She had three rooms she rented out. And she wanted boys because we were loud. She says, I don't want girls. You know, they, they whisper. You know, they, I want boys. So we were loud. We made noise. But her husband's family built the house in 1911. Her husband died. She continued to live there. It's just a beautiful little house. When I go through Richmond, I always go down Park Avenue with her. Next slide. This is the foyer where every night I came in from work at Mellon Rose. Her bedroom was in here. And uh, this is a different. I had to knock on the door and ask somebody if I could take a picture. But she had a table here. And every night, she, my father usually wrote me every day from work. He would drop me a note for $3 or $4. And $4 was like 100 That was just walking around the money. Just good to get. She had Wheel of Fortune on. She had a glass of sherry. I have watched every episode of Wheel of Fortune <laughs> from 1979 to 1980. Uh, <laughs> drinking a little glass of sherry with Mrs. Walker. And um, she was she was somebody that taught me that um, it's not about things or possessions. Again, she opened her home to strangers, to students, to boys. And I was happy to do it. And I don't think it was about the money. It was about opening her home and being hospitable and gracious, graciously, incredibly wonderful. Speaking about gracious, this is my other parents, um, Elizabeth and Lynn Barrow. He was a rear admiral in the Coast Guard. Uh, I can tell you a quick how they met story. He was three years older. 
She had sisters. She told her sister, uh uh, he's too old for me, you go out with him. He came to the door one night, his mother answered the door. She said, Elizabeth, when Barrow is here, he says you said you're going on a date with him. She said, I never said any such thing. She said, You're going on a date. He's here, you're going out. So they went out. They have traveled the world together. Uh, interesting story. She was enrolled in Greensboro Teachers College. She has a teaching degree, but she got involved in fashion and merchandising. And a New York designer, who I didn't know the name of until I Googled it, I was shocked, asked her to come to work in New York. She was so impressed with what she was doing and what she was wearing. And this was in 1942. And if you Google this person's name, they're going to be the name. It's Hattie Carnegie. She was a member of the Carnegie family, and she was a designer from the late 30s to the mid 50s. She could have been Calvin Klein in her era, and she pursued that. But she married this man and did great things with him, especially in New Orleans, where he was coming up. She opened up a boys and girls club on base with children that had nowhere else to go mm -hmm. in New Orleans. She did that single handedly, and it's named Elizabeth Farrell, Boys and Girls Club of New Orleans. This is her. This is about a year before she passed away. She was telling me, don't take my picture. Don't take my picture. Uh, this lady, she is Finnish, Rhoda Stone. She was Rhoda Lindros. And uh, she survived She survived just about everything. But the Germans didn't try and destroy in Helsinki. The Russians tried to. And she woke up one morning in 1940. And uh, they had strafed the whole front of her street in Helsinki. Her block was the only one standing. And they fled to her parents' farm outside of Helsinki. And um, so she has a story to tell. She had great adversity. She worked in the Moscow Embassy, uh, the Finnish Embassy in Moscow, met her husband, who was from Tipton, Georgia, a Scandinavian from Helsinki, Finland, who married a man from Georgia. And she lives in Canada. That's her look. This lady is um, my aunt, my adopted aunt, aunt Joyce Bannister. This is her daughter, Laura, who, if she were here today, would have any stitches. She, she has, I'll just make it short. Her mother told both her daughters, You'll never amount to me. You don't have any, you haven't gone to school, you haven't, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to see you again. Um, she has her landscaping business and is doing very well, and is taking care of her mother and now her sister who is in the Great adversity. Being told by your mother you'll never amount to anything, and now she's caring for her mother. Um, this is her other sister, who's the one very sick right now. This is Cindy. This is one of her nightmare. That's in place. She can see the way. Oh, this lady is great. This is my co-worker, Anya Putney, and this is her son, Juan. This was graduation. These are her cousins. This lady, um, single-handedly, has worked herself up within our organization. She's brilliant. She should run the organization. And got away from a bad marriage, an abusive marriage, I think, and bought her own home. And I think is going to have a, a career for a long time. She has a story. I mean, you should bring her over here. She has her and her, her passion about life. So, a son who graduated high school and college, I think he's going into the Navy. Abraham Lincoln, we all know who he was. Uh, a complete failure by a lot of people of that era. Uh, ran for Congress, ran one term, was sent home. Ran for Senate, was beaten badly. His wife said, Well, you're going to just run a law practice here. And then he gave a speech at the Cooper Union. And uh, it was the uh, 1960 presidential election. Blue, blue, and white. This little man with a shrill voice had 14,000, I think, people just captive. They didn't realize this rail splitter was this dynamic and charismatic. And he became a president during the most, I think, the first times in this country, especially, especially here in this area. Um, taken. Excellent. I think he was. Anybody know this man? 
Please do. Box Well, it's like Box He's American. He had a studio that took all the photographs that you see of you, Brady. Thank you, Brady. Thank you. Uh, very poor eyesight, poor family, peasant, peasant uh, from Scotland, and immigrated to America. And Library of Congress, when he was destitute, had taken all of these photographs on glass plates and then later on pen types and camera types. Didn't want any of his slides. Didn't want anything. I mean, he's the Andy Warhol, and they're saying, forget it. This is pitiful. Um, they now are sorry. Of course, they have many of them from the Batman archive. And through, I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got so many of them back. We would not have so many images of even Abraham Lincoln if it weren't for he and his assistant Andrew Gardner and Tony Sullivan. And it told people of the horrors of the war. People had never seen photographs of the war until the Civil War. Um, Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel. The Statue of David in the back of the feet in Rome, 33 feet of Carrara marble. That he said, it wasn't so much I carved the image of David in, it's what I chipped away. It's what I brought the marble out of. And if anybody, I have yet to see it. I, I really want to go to Rome to see that. But he worked for two popes of the Catholic Church who were horrible. I'm sorry, I didn't know them, but what they know of them is horrible. Both Leo. Pope Pius X and Pope Leo, I think, fourteenth, they would demand that he do things and then they wouldn't pay. And if you ever seen a real schmaltzy movie called The Agony and Ecstasy with um, Rex Harrison and Charlton Heston, Charlton Heston played by Angela. It's really bad. But it's factually correct. He was on his back, six inches from the system of ceiling with with uh, temper paint for years, painting the system of chapel. He was a sculptor. He wasn't a painter. He was told to do something that wasn't his passion. But he did the painting. And he did it so that when you see it, again, I've never seen it, it looks like the figures are actually sculpted. And they're painted in flush colors. They actually look like they're painted down to the three dimensional. And he had a saying that I have written down, but basically, I'm a little man of the whole world, given a talent by God hoping to extend my days in this earth. And we all remember him. And uh, we don't tend to remember the folks. We just remember him. Okay. Now, this this student um, is with us today. And she has, she has been passionate about uh, her rock following. And um, she is <laughs> I think she has found. I think she's found it. Don't you think? No. Looks like she's on her way. <laughs> Out the door to the penny quarter area. Yes, she's on her way somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's the you know. Well, that's my talk, and I hope I didn't bore you to tears and give you sort of the background of other people. What they did, what I did. I think we've learned a lot about the people who inspire and motivate you in your life. But is there a specific life-changing experience that contributes, like that happened when you were our age, that contributes to your current success? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was when I was thrown out of work. I was working for Rutke Associates, and the economy was so bad in 1980. It was bad. Um, Ronald Reagan hadn't come in yet. I mean, the whole Reagan you know, trickle down economics. And uh, I was scared. I was really scared. Of it. It's back to Borders. You know, it's back to Fort Rogers. And I got a call from a man who knew my dad, sort of two degrees of separation. And he said, Hello, I'm Otis Yoakum. Do you remember me? And my dad said, yeah. uh, Well, I work at the administrative office of the U.S. courts. He said, I know your son has a, a degree in architecture design. Yeah, in fact, John's part of the other work. He said, so, tell you what, tell him to come in for an interview. Mm -hmm. He said, we're moving, we're expanding into some buildings which we never went into. We built our building right now. But they were going to backfill some existing buildings. Can your son necessarily do some space planning? I'll do anything. I'll, I'll cook you lunch. 
And I interviewed with Otis, and he said, sure, you know, it's a temporary job. Um, we'd love to have you. I've been there 32 years. I've been there 32 years. So, yeah, there were times where I thought, do I want to? And I've had opportunities. I've had people come to me and say, hey, come work for us, and courts and GSA. But I say this, and it's true. You don't leave a job, you leave people. When you get in your job, you think, I have to leave. It's usually because of certain people. And when you find that those people are driving you nuts, then you have to say, I need to take a break. I need a break. But if you like what you do, and you're passionate, passionate you like helping. That's the thing. If I help someone today get out of a stuck elevator, just walk in the window, we fix the elevator. I did something. I actually did something. And they were thankful. So it's that simple. I think we have a lot of time for today. So, if anyone wants to ask any questions, you've given out a lot of um, historical figures that you know, Lincoln and Michelangelo. What, what are their like, you know, sort of values or like, lessons that you don't give up? He was ready to give up. There was his law partner, William Burton. Mary Lincoln just said, we're done. You know, I'll sit here in Springfield the rest of my life. She actually knew the greatness about them. Um, they were engaged to be married. He broke it off. You don't do that in 1833. I mean, the woman is basically, she has to leave town. Um, people were worried about him. He was suicidal. There was a suicidal watch on huh? him. And his friend William Burton said, look, you know, I see greatness in you. I've worked with you as a law partner. This woman that you're engaged to sees greatness in you. She could have married Stephen Douglas. She could have married who went on to be the great senator. She could have been Mrs. Senator. She came to be the first lady. So don't don't let people label you. Don't let people say to you, you're from a certain part of the country, or you're not from this country, or say you have no work. Uh, he had went to school. He was so backwards, they don't even know where his actually first home was in the Indiana Territory. There's no mark. It was just Williams. He was in Williams. But he was plucked out of obscurity in a time in this country where we had fractured open the country that we all live in. And all so yeah, don't, don't let people tell you you're a family. The, the Barrows, of course, uh, Lynn Barrow. Uh, this is a funny story about the Barrows. Um, Mrs. Barrow is very outspoken, extremely outspoken. And his career probably was a bit derailed because of his wife, because of the military, especially in the, in the services. You go along, you get along. You know, if somebody, your wife, you're, you're married, and you're in the military, your wife, it's usually they say, uh uh, we don't like her. She's, she's a problem. And he was up for Admiral, and he never got it. And uh, she always told me it's because of him. And I said, no, he's still great. He still did good things. He was still successful, not because of you know what you said, which was right. The military was corrupt, and it was New Orleans, and it was the dredging of the river. And everybody remember Hugo? Remember that story? Remember what happened to New Orleans? Okay. He told them 25 years ago, don't do that with the Coast Guard. You know, don't dredge things so low that you don't have any high walls of Lake Pontchartrain in the river. And the storm came, the storm surged, and the war, I think it's Ward 5. And I called him right after that, and I said, you tell me. And he said, John, I told him what they were doing 25 years ago. And uh, so I guess listen to people. Listen to what the people who are professionals. Because they're gentle. So, um, my dad, he just listened to my mother. He followed what she told him to do. Um, have someone beside you, you know, who's a friend, who is a mentor, always. Your brother, your older sister, the gun. Um, <laughs> no gun. Uh, but have somebody that you can go back to from time to time just to say, Am I off in this? Am I, you know, 
you know me, you've known me all my life. You know, am I doing this wrong or what? You know, generally, your family would tell you. But they let you go down the road because if they told you then, you always blame them. Mm -hmm. Don't date that guy. Don't go out with him. You, know, and you have to do it and then find out for yourself. But they painfully watch from the sidelines. Um, I have a picture of somebody that I was going to show. But they kept telling me, do not date this woman. Do not even marry this woman. You don't know anything about this woman. Mm -hmm. It's true. But, you know, love is blind. It's true. And I was blind, but I wasn't stupid. And, uh, so, there, there are people watching. You'll, as you get older, you'll have a sixth sense of them. Can you elaborate more on, um, so like, when you were in college, are there any skill set that you learned that helped yes. you yes. to get to where you are now? Yes. The skill set that I didn't find out until later was don't be afraid to challenge a party. Don't be afraid to step out of the box that someone is telling you that you need. Because generally, that's where creativity, IT, all the IT stuff that's out there now, Bill Gates was the one pushing it. And people like Bill Gates. Because they were telling him, no, that would work. You know, that little thing they're doing in your garage, Jeff Bezos and all that, that is Amazon. I mean, they said that would never work. So don't, you can be respectful, but then there's a point where you have to challenge what someone's going to do. In other words, we never go anywhere in society. We just stay put. And they call it status quo. You know, keep the status quo. But that, that doesn't work in creativity. In creativity. Especially creativity. All right. Uh, we have a question from someone online. Mm -hmm. His name is Richard. Richard. Hi. Hi, John. Hi, Richard. Hi, thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you. Um, so a little about myself, I studied biomedical engineering, and mm -hmm. I, I worked with uh, medical devices. But um, three months ago, I moved to Rhode Island to work with Hasbro, mm -hmm. and now I work on their patent protection for their toys. Um, but it's been three months, and I'm thinking about going back to grad school part-time, but it's for something completely different like marketing and brand management. So, <laughs> I No, there's a lot of worry and doubt because I have to start over. I feel like I have to start over. So, I mean, how would you, how would you get over that doubt process during the whole, like, reinventive, you know, thing that I'm going through right now? Well, first of all, I sympathize with you, and I hope you do get that career path and you can get that going. Actually, my niece is in marketing. She's with the Lucky Corporation in Birmingham. And um, she wanted to do something else as well. She wanted to do fashion merchandising, but she went into marketing. She had to change her thinking and change her rearranging of what she wanted to do. She's 24. Um, I would have to tell you that if you think this is the best thing to do right now, then do it. Um, is it a money problem? Is it just financial right now? Um, well, I mean, there are bills that I have to continue to, you know, pay, but it's more of like a passion problem because I'm I'm not passionate about like what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to look for something that fits my personality, fits my interest, and I think marketing might be one of um, that thing, you know, that fits me. I think you. I heard words fit you. I kept hearing what fits me. And only you know what that is, but I think that's a key key phrase, something you kept saying. Right now, you don't fit where you are, right? Is it Hasbro? Yeah, the, uh, the toy maker. You'll be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be miserable. So step out, step out uh -huh. of the box. And, yeah. Happiness, you know, is... It's personal. It's a, it's something you have to find, and uh, you have to make yourself happy, and also a living and pay the bills. But you will be miserable to stay where you are. Um, okay, so tying it up, tying the uh, the things. Um, I know that you know that patient is one of the virtues that we have in. 
see what the issue is. Um, I think you talk about um, if you can don't get along with the boss, no matter how much you love your job. Well, what is like the limit you set? What, what, what do you say? When well, you want to kill them. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Yeah, when you reach a certain point where you don't respect that person, you said it. It's about respect and trust. When I lose your trust and I lose your respect, that's it. I have to somehow move on and go work for somebody else. You leave people if you don't need a job. And we're we're experiencing some of that now in about people who have lost my respect because I see what they do and don't. Do. They're watching. People are watching you within your company and in your life to see how you react and see what you do in those situations. And they'll earn, you will earn their respect and trust just by how you behave in those situations. Be respectful, definitely. But challenge that person and say, did you really mean to say that to me? Are you going to sit here and do nothing? Or do you, what do you want me to do? Because your job is to lead me. Management is to tell me what. That's, it's not the other way around. So I think managers forget to do that. They just do it by rote and think it's going to be done and everything's going to be fine. No, you have to lead. You have to show me how to do this by example. Those are the people I know. They really get you going. They really do. You want to go into work every day because this person's going to make challenge me, get me going. Hey, John, that's not right. Oh, well, tell me what to, what to do better. I'd rather have that than know review or any action at all. I'm just working away. I'm in my hamster cage. Mm -hmm. Which ships are you? And you're miserable with Hasbro. Well, I mean, honestly, I'm not miserable with Hasbro. I think Hasbro has a lot of great opportunities that I'm not in right now. And um, I understand that Hasbro is like a market-driven company. So I feel like I can talk to people that are already doing what they're doing and get you know advice, insight from them. Before I take the plunge, you know, and go like all in. So that's that's my plan right now. But there's still that worry that you know I'm 25 right now, soon to be 26, and I might have to start my whole career path over again. You know. You're you're young enough. I can tell you from being 56, you're young enough to start over on a career path. Don't worry about that. If you were in your late 40s to 50s, that might be a problem because there's more competition. But being younger and being exposed to technology at a younger age, it'll be okay. I know I couldn't go back into the job market not having the IT skills that I don't have. You know, I'd have to go back to school. Are there any other questions that we have for John? I want to talk a little bit about paying your dues. Because you, mm -hmm. you know, these younger kids, as they graduate and start their career, mm -hmm. how much patience and warning should you give them in terms of, you know, have it, you really have to pay the dues to get to where you want to be. Yeah, it's, you hate it. I know that's a strong word, so hate something, but in, in order to, to move ahead, you have to do some things for long, some period of time that are pleasant, and sometimes you really don't want to deal again with those people. I think it's the people that you have to pay back and do this to. Um, paybacks are hard. Um, but it gets better. As you get older, I think when you hit, I know I did, when I hit 50, I thought everything is me. There's nothing that's going to be a surprise now. I've had just about everything that could happen to me, and I'm OK. I'm all right. So there's an age. It sort of comes with age. And that's hard to think about now in your early your teens or your 20s. But uh, paybacks will end. <coughs> They're not with you. And then you get to run a company. And you get to do a job. Remember. All right. Thank you, John. Wow. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a little bit about John. He's too humble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he is a superstar at work. Super wow. duper star. Um, he has been my mentor, my teacher, 
my inspiration for the last 12, 14 years I've been there. Um, he is a wealth of knowledge, obviously, because he's been there for 30 plus years. Um, all of our colleagues look up to him. John is um, an amazing artist. But what I like about him most is that he is this rare breed of a human being. Um, he treats everyone at work with the utmost respect and kindness. I was having a bad day, John. Do you remember this a couple years ago? He said he had a big me a peach pie. He <laughs> came into the office with a peach pie and magazine. Puts it on my desk. He closed the door and said, you know, take a moment to yourself. Oh, Who good. does that, John? Nobody. I didn't do it for Oh. You know, we, your, your assistant, remember, Laura, yep. when she retired, um, he bought balloons in, he set up a tea setting for her. Um, you know, just little things like that goes a long way. When you guys are out there working, building relationships, um, I feel that, you know, that extra effort will go a long way in helping people um, appreciate what you do and how you affect them in life. John, um, you know, being an artist is also very quick -witted. He has translated that into his cartooning of people at work, and I have been also. You're my inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> so I had some um, copies made of all the cartoons that he's done over the years of me, which is really funny. But in closing, I thank you, John, for. Oh, 